Right. On to our next uh, group of molecules, which are fatty acids. We need to see the same thing we did for glycogen. How do we degrade our fatty acids? And then how do we build new fatty acids for making membranes and, and other molecules? So the first thing we're going to do is take a, a fatty acid that you would get as a food source or from a membrane as a food source and degrade it. Once we've degraded it completely all the way to acetyl-CoA, that's going to be our, our target molecule, then we'll see how we build fatty acid molecules from acetyl-CoA, much like we did with glycogen. And so let's start from the beginning and describe our fatty acid metabolism as a whole again. So this is a, a molecule that's not soluble in water, right? a long chain fatty acid. So what's the point of these molecules? Well, we can store them as food. Right? We can store them in our, our membranes and store them in vesicles for later. And then we degrade them later for more acetyl-CoA, which can enter the citric acid cycle and be used to generate ATP. But fatty acids have other purposes. They're not just food molecules. So we store them as triacylglycerols generally. So it's three fatty acids stuck on a glycerol molecule. We've seen this before. And they're stored in mainly two places. Right? These are in, in adipose tissue, either directly under the skin, called subcutaneous fat, or in surrounding internal organs, called visceral fat. Right? They're both storage forms of acetyl-CoA, but they have other purposes. So subcutaneous fat found directly under the skin has what secondary purpose, other than being a food source? Retention. What's that? Does it help you retain heat? So it's, it's a heat barrier, exactly. So it, it retains heat and it also prevents um, heat loss or, or heat gain. So it, it's an insulating barrier due to, or insulation for heat from heat, right? Either loss or gain, right? What about the fat surrounding the internal organs, this visceral fat? What's its secondary purpose? It's like protection and cushioning. Right, so protection from uh, like shock. I don't mean electrical shock, I mean like physical shock, so of, of a, a jarring motion or injury from uh, a blunt trauma or something like that. So the internal organs need to be protected because you've probably heard if you get into a wreck or you get hit by something, it's, it's not just one collision, right? There's everything collides into each other, it's like your, your brain will collide into the internal part of the skull. So that, that causes injury as well. So your internal organs as well, like your heart and your lungs and your liver, especially the spleen, are, you know, are subject to exploding or getting hit by blood trauma. So we have all this visceral fat around these organs, which sort of cushions that, that bumping into other things when you're hit, especially uh, things like your heart. You can't have that explode, right? You're dead. So the most common organ you're going to see if you work in an ER later, that someone comes in from an automotive accident or, you know, whatever, they fell off a house or whatever it might be, the most common organ that you see that's not so well protected will be the spleen, right? It tends to explode. Okay, so if someone's had blunt trauma and you see some bruising in the abdomen area, make sure they have an have a exploding spleen, right? Because you kind of need it, All right? So on to what we do with these triacylglycerols. So we need to turn them into free fatty acids, right? So first thing we need to do is mobilize it. So we do it by lipolysis. So on the right is our triacylglyceride or triacylglycerol, same thing. Then we use a lipase. We talked about this once before when we we're talking about lipids. And we degrade the, the three ester bonds we have. So we have three ester bonds are turned into a glycerol and three individual fatty acids. Well, the glycerol is rather easy to think about. That can go directly into our glycolytic pathway with just a few modifications. But the fatty acids cannot. They cannot enter the glycolytic pathway. Okay, so last time we did this, we focused mainly on the glycerol. But what do we do with these fatty acids now? Right? We need to do several things. We mobilize them. Right? We need to get them to another cell type, if, from your food to this different cell type or from one cell to another. We need to transport them. Uh, they're not very soluble in water, so that could be an issue. And then we need to move them from whatever target cell we end up in from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria because fatty acid degradation occurs in the mitochondria. So, and it makes sense that it would occur there because where are we gonna use our result of this, acetyl-CoA, in the matrix of the mitochondria for our citric acid cycle? So let's degrade them there. 
So it makes perfect sense. But we need to get them into there first. So from one cell to another, and then from the cell surface through the cytoplasm to the mitochondria and across that inner membrane into the mitochondria. So how do we get there? Okay, so here's a, a diagram of the whole process once again. So at the very beginning, we have some seven transmembrane receptor with a hormone. This should look familiar at this point. You know this pathway, we've seen it several times. So some hormone tells a cell to start mobilizing its lipids, right? Much like we do with glycogen, turning it into glucose. We're going to mobilize our lipids and turn them into free fatty acids. Okay, so we have some kind of cell signal happen. ATP is turned into cyclic AMP, activating protein kinase A. And once again, protein kinase A does what kinase things do, right? And phosphorylates something. It's another of many targets is our triacylglycerol lipase. This is the lipase that breaks those ester bonds of triacylglycerols. So it turns triacylglycerols into diacylglycerols, into monoacylglycerols, into free glycerol. All right. The point of all that is to release the fatty acids. Okay. And they're exported out of the cell, right, or out of this particular vesicle, if they're in a vesicle, and onto other cells or onto other parts of that cell. Okay. So we say this diagram once before. Our triacylglycerol from a, a adipocyte, you get glycerol and the free fatty acids. These free fatty acids aren't going to be floating around in the blood very easily. So they're going to be linked to a carrier like serum albumin because we need to make them soluble in the, the blood. We'll end up at other tissues like a liver cell. And in the liver, the glycerol can be used once we phosphorylate it and oxidize it once, shown at the bottom. We can turn it into pyruvate by going down glycolysis or we can turn it into glucose by continuing up the strategy for gluconeogenesis. Okay. The other molecules, the fatty acids, go into the other target cells, whatever they might be, muscle cells or other brain cells, or red blood cells even, and they go in there and make their way to the mitochondria and get turned into acetyl-CoA. That's what we're going to talk about for the most part the rest of this lecture. All right. Making acetyl-CoA, which you know is then used in the citric acid cycle to generate electrons and ATP. Okay, So how do we get these fatty acids activated? So they get from one cell to another by albumin and once they're at the new cell they need to be coupled to something. Okay, So they make their way by another carrier all the way to the mitochondrial outer membrane. Now we haven't talked much about the outer mitochondrial membrane. We've said everything's happening at the the inner mitochondrial membrane. That's where all our action was. The electron transport chain and the transporters and the the, the little tunnels that let certain molecules in or out. With it. But we said a few things happen at the outer membrane that we get to, and this is the one I'm going to talk about. Right? Very few enzymes are here on the outer membrane, and this is the important one for what we're going to cover. Okay, so in the outer, outer membrane, we have an enzyme that's going to connect our fatty acid and an ATP using an ATP molecule to a CoA molecule. This is called an acyl-CoA synthetase. Right, so it takes an acyl group that's not acetyl, that's acyl. Acyl means any length carbon. And it's going to connect it to a CoA. And what type of bond is this enzyme making? Look at the product on the right. What type of bond am I making? Thioester. That's a thioester. Is that a stable? bond or is there going to be some uphill battle to make that? It's an unstable bond. It's, it's not terrible but it's not very stable. Right. So I'm going to need an input of energy to assemble this. I'm going to use it in the form of ATP. And so ATP, the phosphates and the adenosine are not getting incorporated into this. Just the hydrolysis of this ATP is being used to power this unfavorable assembly. So this thioester bond I've created has some of the energy left over from that hydrolysis. But overall, this thing is a negative delta G. Right? It's totally reversible, as you see. So what prevents it from going backwards? Pyrophosphate hydrolysis. Right, so pyrophosphate hydrolysis by pyrophosphatase. So this is what I was talking about in the last lecture, which I hadn't realized we hadn't done this one yet, it's the last time you're going to use these nucleotides to activate something. We did this with DNA, we did this with RNA, we did this with amino acids, we did this with carbohydrates on the previous lecture. 
and now we're doing it with fatty acids. Okay? And then you can do it with other molecules too, other lipids, and they'll use CTP for that. But here's the one I want you to know. It looks very similar to these other activation steps. Okay, so we're going to use ATP to activate this, and this occurs in a, a two-step process. Okay? So we start out with a fatty acid right, and an ATP molecule, and what happens is the carboxyl group right, attacks the alpha phosphate, liberating the gamma and beta phosphates. Right? So uh, pyrophosphate's released. Of course, this gets immediately hydrolyzed by pyrophosphatase to drive this forward. And now, how, now I've made this acyl adenylate. Right? It's AMP, but instead of having three phosphates on it, it only has one followed by the fatty acid. Right? And that's shown up here at the top. Is this a stable arrangement? Think back to our themes. Is this a stable arrangement? No. Why not? No. Beta keto. It's a beta keto arrangement, exactly. So using the hydrolysis of ATP, the latter two phosphates leaving, is what allowed me to make this happen. Right? But I can't go backwards from here and make an ATP. Right? I need a pyrophosphate to do that. And we just degraded it. So then I have this very unstable intermediate and another molecule, our CoA, comes along with its sulfur, and the sulfur then attacks the same carbonyl and green here, liberating the AMP, which is a great leaving group. And now I have my CoA molecule attached to the carboxylate of the acyl group. Okay, so now I've made an acyl CoA. So AMP is being released, and I drive it forward by the hydrolysis of pyrophosphate. So what does it cost me to put this fatty acid on a CoA? I'm saying it costs two ATP equivalents. I didn't use two ATP molecules. I used an ATP debit card and charged it twice. So you're going to think about it that way. Because I, I took both phosphates off. I did a, a removal of the beta and the gamma phosphates. So to get this back to ATP, I'm going to have to put two phosphates back on. So this cost me what we're going to call two ATP equivalents. All right, so it's expensive so far. This is just as expensive as turning glucose into glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate and then with PFK to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. That also costs two ATP equivalents. So, so far this is quite expensive. Just to get the fatty acid activated, and I haven't got anything out of this yet. right? So it's an uphill initiation or an uphill investment just like we did with glycolysis. We also did this in the previous lecture where we got our glucose activated. It cost me a UTP Right? Again, it cost me two ATP equivalents. I had to lose both phosphates. So again, an investment of two. Here's also an investment of two. Okay, so I have my acyl-CoA at the bottom. Right? This should look very familiar to some other process we've already done. Right? This is almost identical to which other process in every way. I take a molecule, I make an adetylate of that molecule, then I use another molecule to relieve it from the adetylate, making an unstable, in this case, thioester, but in the other case, ester. All right, replace fatty acid with amino acid and replace CoA with tRNA, and it's the exact same chemistry. The only thing that changed is instead of having a thioester, I have a regular ester. Otherwise, the chemistry is identical. Okay, so keep that in mind. I'm trying to draw c connections between the different processes you've seen. That they're not quite that, that different. It's just I'm replacing some substrates with others. Okay. All right, so this happened at the outer membrane, right? We put our fatty acid on a CoA. Well, it's still not very water soluble, right? I need to get it into the matrix. So to get it across the outer membrane is not a problem because there's holes in the outer membrane. It can transfer from one side to the other rather easily. But sometimes the outer membrane, the outer mitochondrial membrane, and the inner mitochondrial membrane make contact with each other, right? The one surrounds the other. It makes sense that they're going to make contact. And it's very easy to, to bump one into the other. So my acyl CoA can easily get close to the inner membrane. Right? And in that intermembrane space, 
there's an enzyme called the carnitine acyl transferase. Okay, there's actually two versions of it. There's carnitine acyl transferase 1, which is the one we're talking about. And it takes my acyl-CoA, the very thing I just made, plucks the, the acyl group right off of it and puts it on carnitine. Carnitine is a very water-soluble molecule, as you see there. Right? It's, it's got a few carbons in it, quite a few um, oxygens and nitrogens, and a nitrogen that can make it more water-soluble. And my acyl group is attached to the alcohol group on the middle carbon. Okay, so I have an acyl carnitine. I've transferred a thioester bond or exchanged a thioester bond for an ester bond. That's favorable, right? And I release the CoA. The acyl carnitine, it may not look like it at first, but that's a better way to get across this inner membrane. It's not going to diffuse across, of course, but we have an enzyme or a translocator or a some kind of transporter that will get it across the membrane. Okay, so this translocase is located in the inner mitochondrial membrane and it transfers an acyl carnitine in if it lets a carnitine out. Right, it's one for one exchange. So it's just a, a transporter, it lets acyl carnitine in and carnitine out. And both of those are going to be down their gradients, so it's a very favorable reaction. Okay, so we have our acyl carnitine inside now in the matrix. And a very similar enzyme, carnitine acyl transferase 2, does the exact opposite chemistry. Both are reversible, but it prefers to go in the other direction. It takes the acyl group off of carnitine and puts it back on a CoA. It seems like we are right back where we started, but what did this accomplish or bypass me having to do? So this, this whole carnitine shuttle allowed me to bypass doing what? Creating uh, acyl coenzyme A from scratch in the matrix? Well, I have one in the cytoplasm, right? Right. And I could just drag it across the membrane and it would be in the matrix. I don't have to create one. I just have to drag it across the membrane. But if you remember, what does the structure of CoA look like? Really big. Right, it's an adenosine ring, right, with phosphates, and ribose, and yeah, that's not gonna be dragged across the membrane, right? So I put it on a smaller version of that, carnitine, I could get that across the membrane using this translocase. It also keeps my two pools of CoA, the one in the cytoplasm, and the pool of it that's in the matrix, separate, right? Because we know those were also used by other enzymes, right? The CoA was clearly used by the citric acid cycle, and the CoA is also used by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So I'd like to keep those two pools of CoA separate. Okay? And the two carnitine acyl transferases that prep this for the translocation are both reversible. They just prefer to go in opposite directions, right? Of course, the the Chatelier's principle also applies. They'll go in the direction that they're favored with more substrates or fewer products. Okay, so we've transferred an acyl group first onto a CoA using two ATP equivalents, then onto carnitine, which allowed me to get it across the membrane, and then back from carnitine onto a CoA in the matrix. So once again, I'm at an acyl-CoA, and I'm in the matrix. That's what I've accomplished so far. So everything else after this is degrading that acyl-CoA in the matrix, and it goes pretty fast. Okay, so we're going to do four steps here. Okay, so it's a stepwise reduction. Our acyl-CoA has a long tail on it. I don't know how many carbons it has. It just has a long tail. And I'm going to take them apart two carbons at a time. And every time I take two carbons away, I'm going to put it on yet another CoA and make an acetyl-CoA. And I'm going to continue doing that round by round until I have no carbons left. Okay, the reactions are, are fairly simple. The four reactions involve taking the fatty acid, doing an oxidation, first by FAD, then we hydrate that, then we do another oxidation by NAD, and then we break a bond using CoA. Okay, this should look familiar. Right? It's very, very similar to the last three reactions of the citric acid cycle. Right? In fact, it's almost no different. So the oxidation by FAD, hydration by water, 
and oxidation by NAD plus are the last three steps of the citric acid cycle. Right? Remember we abbreviated it Ohio, oxidation, hydration, oxidation. And this one we'll call Ohio State because in the end we don't stop there. We do a thiolysis or a sulfur transfer. So there's the ST for Ohio State. Okay. I apologize to all the Michigan fans. So let's, let's go over our analogy at the bottom, or our numbering system at the bottom. So you have a fatty acid here, and the carbons are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to the end. But remember, we also had our symbolic nomenclature, where the first carbon is the carbonyl carbon, the second carbon is called the alpha carbon, the third the beta, the fourth the gamma, the fifth the delta, and so forth, right? So this is called beta oxidation of fatty acids because the, all the action is going to take place involving the beta carbon. So let's remind ourselves what happened in citric acid cycle. We had two carbons, and we oxidized them using FAD. That simply made a double bond. Then we hydrated it to turn it into malate. That was adding an OH and an H. Then we oxidized the malate. That was turning that secondary alcohol into a carbonyl to make oxaloacetate. We're going to do the exact same chemistry here, except it's all going to be focused on the beta carbon. Okay, so here's our four steps. Number one, oxidation by FAD. So I have a long fatty acid chain here. And if you had to label these carbons in the chain, the one with the double bonded oxygen is the carbonyl carbon, or carbon number one. The next two colored red here are carbons two and three, or alpha and beta, respectively. Okay, so we're going to do our oxidation using FAD. Makes sense because there's no O's, N's, or F's involved. So we're going to use FAD, not NAD+. That rule still applies. And we get our double bond, right? We make the alkene. Happens to be trans in this case, but it's sort of irrelevant because uh, the next step we're going to get rid of it anyway. But what do we get out of this step? Well, in order to do this oxidation from the alkane to the alkene, I must also reduce something. I'm going to reduce the FAD, the FAD to FADH2. That's not a problem because we've already talked about what happens to this FADH2, right? We're going to use it. It's a source of energy. There's some electrons we can use there. We're going to send that FADH2 down to complex 2, which is right here in the matrix, to continue our electron transport chain. So we can regenerate our FAD no problem. We've already talked about what happens to it. In the next step, we take our double bonded enoyl CoA, right, not an acyl CoA anymore, it's got a double bond in it, and we hydrate it. Now, you remember Makovnikov's rule, right? When we add an asymmetric molecule to an asymmetric double bond, it goes to the least occupied side, right? The OH is going to go on the, the more substituted side. Well, enzymes don't follow Makovnikov's rule, and in fact here it's symmetrical, right? Each side has one H. But the enzyme will always put the OH on the beta carbon, right? So enzymes generally don't follow those chemical rules because they do what they want. They only allow access certain ways. And so when we do this hydration of the enoyl CoA, we always put the hydroxy on number three, or the beta carbon. So that's why it's called 3-hydroxy-acyl-CoA, or beta-hydroxy-acyl-CoA, okay? So this is just like we take our, our fumarate into malate, same type of chemistry. And the next step, we do what we do with malate to oxaloacetate, is we oxidize that secondary alcohol. Because it's an alcohol we're oxidizing, we can't use FAD, we need to use NAD plus this time, because there's an O involved. So our NAD plus gets reduced to NADH at a proton, and we already know what happens to that later, right? That can enter at complex one, donate its electrons, and we get some ATP made from that. But now we've made a carbonyl at the beta carbon. So it's a beta keto acyl CoA or a three keto acyl CoA. And by the name alone, you can probably guess that that's not stable. It's a, by definition a beta keto arrangement, right? So this is not stable at all. And so we'll use a CoA to come in and attack the same beta carbon every time everything's happening here at the beta carbon. So my sulfur will attack the beta carbon, breaking the alpha-beta-carbon-carbon -carbon bond. Same one we turned into a double bond earlier. We're going to break it into no bond. And that releases the first two carbons, the carbon 1 and 2, are the carbonyl carbon and the alpha carbon, along with the CoA as acetyl-CoA. The remaining molecule from the beta carbon onward is now attached to the new CoA that came in, and it's still a long fatty acid attached to CoA. It's just now two carbons shorter than it was to start with. 
which two carbons were removed? The first two, carbons one and two. They leave as acetyl-CoA, or carbons carbonyl and alpha, right? Carbonyl and alpha left as acetyl-CoA. Now, every carbon in the chain that was number three, four, five, six, seven has been promoted by two ranks, right? Carbon number three, or the beta carbon, is now the carbon number one, or the carbonyl carbon. Carbon number six is now carbon number four. Carbon number 18 is now number 16. Everybody moved up two ranks. And then we take our ACO-CoA and we do this again. Right? We go through the same pathway one more time. We'll get out yet another acetyl-CoA and it'll be two carbons shorter once again. And we'll keep doing that until we run out of carbons. Okay, so what do we get every round? So if I do a complete round where I start with an ACO-CoA and I end with an ACO-CoA two carbons shorter, what things did I get out of this? Well, I consumed a water molecule. We're going to kind of ignore that. I did consume a CoA, but it's not destroyed. It's just on my new product. But I did get an FADH2, and I did get an NADH out of this. So that's important. I get those two things, which give me lots of ATP. Okay. If I continue doing this, here's my, let's say this is uh, 16 carbons up here. I think that's 16. Yes, yeah, 16. And I do this one round, I'm going to get an acetyl-CoA out of it. Now this CoA is not necessarily the, the same CoA as the one down here. This new blue one is the one that came in that did this thiolysis. So the CoAs keep changing colors as well, and that's correct. So these two leave with the red CoA to form acetyl-CoA. The beta carbon becomes the new carbonyl carbon on a new CoA in blue. Okay. And what did I get out of that? I got an FADH2, I got an NADH, I got a proton. And I got a CoA, acetyl-CoA. That's important. I got this acetyl-CoA in red here that left. So here's my list of things I got. One acetyl-CoA, one FADH2, one NADH, and one proton. I did consume a water molecule as well. Right? Now this thing has 14 carbons. Let's do it again. I get two more carbons out, and I'm down to 12 carbons. And I keep doing this over and over and over. How many rounds will I do for 16 carbons? I lose two every round. Did you say 16, 16 carbons? carbons? I start with 16 carbons, and I lose a two carbon acetyl CoA every round. How many rounds will it take? Eight. Why do you say eight? She lose two every round. So let me go back. Sixteen. So let me go. It's okay. Everyone says that. It's actually uh -huh. it's actually seven. But we're gonna prove it to you, and you'll you'll prove it to yourself. Let's say we have sixteen carbons here with the ACO CoA I start with. If I do one round, I get my FADH two. I consume more water. I get my NADH and a proton. I consume a CoA, and I get my two carbon acetyl CoA down here. And of course, I have 14 carbons left. Let's fast forward until there are only four carbons left, right? So you've done six rounds, right? There'll be because we started with 16. If I do six rounds, there'll be four carbons left. Okay, so this thing only has four carbons left. So the R group here would not exist, right? The last black carbon here would say CH3. So let's go through the process. I do this pathway. I get an FADH2. I consume more water. I get an NADH. I add my CoA and I get an acetyl-CoA. What will be the leftover piece? How long will it be? Acetyl-CoA. It'll be yet another acetyl-CoA, which I need to do nothing to. It's already an acetyl-CoA. So when I do this, 16 carbons, and I do seven rounds, I remove an acetyl-CoA every round. I'll get seven acetyl-CoAs, seven FADH2s, seven NADHs, seven protons, and I'll have a fatty acid left over that is two carbons long. Hey, that's another acetyl-CoA. So I just group it in with my products. I now have eight acetyl-CoAs. So I don't need to do an eighth round. There's nothing to be done. I just get eight acetyl-CoAs out of it. The leftover piece in the end is an acetyl-CoA. Right? So I consume seven water molecules from the seven rounds. I consume seven CoAs from the seven rounds because I'm starting with one already. Right? It's on a CoA to start with. And I get seven FADH2s, seven NADHs, and seven acetyl-CoAs 
plus the one left over acetyl-CoA to make eight. Okay, so don't memorize a formula to get this because you'll always get it wrong when you start asking you different questions. Think about what you get every round and what might be left over at the end. Okay, in some questions, I'll, I'll ask you to do partial degradation. We'll stop partway through it. Let's say you start with a 16 carbon fatty acid and only do two rounds. What will my products be? Well, in two rounds, I'll get two FADH2s, I'll get two NADHs, I'll get two protons, I'll consume two water molecules, I'll consume two CoAs, and I'll have a 12 carbon fatty acid CoA left over. That's my products. I don't get a CoA out of that at the end. It's not that short yet. So be careful if you're asked to do complete degradation or partial degradation. Think about what you get each round. Okay, don't try to memorize a formula for this. It will hurt you. Right, so how many ATP do we get out of this? Well, how many do I get from uh, acetyl-CoA? It's worth how many ATP? Think back to our electron transport chain and our uh, citric acid cycle. Each acetyl-CoA gives me how many ATP overall? 20 ATP equivalents. It would be 10. 10. 10. Because I'm going to go through the citric acid cycle with it. I'm going to get one directly from the cycle there. And I'm going to get three NADHs, one FADH2, and those four redox reactions. Each NADH is worth two and a half. I have three of those. That's seven and a half. Each FADH2 is worth 1.5, and I have one of those. And I have one GTP or ATP equivalent directly from the cycle. So 7.5 plus 1.5 plus 1 makes 10. So I get 10 from each of those 8 acetyl-CoAs, so that's 80. I get 1.5 from each of these 7 FADH2s, that's 10.5. And I get 2.5 from every NADH, I have 7 of those as well, and that's 17.5. If you add these up, you get 108. I subtract 2 for a grand total of 106. Why did I subtract 2? I'll give you a hint. How many ATP are made gross in glycolysis? How many do you get out of that pathway gross? Four. You get four. You get two at step seven for the pair of molecules going through there, and you get two at step ten for the pair going through there. But why do we say it only generates two net? Right, we had to invest two at steps one and three. Did I have to invest any in this process? If you think back a few slides, we had to activate that fatty acid. And we had to put it on CoA. So putting it on CoA cost me two ATP equivalents. And we made the mirror that it was just like glycolysis. I had to invest two. So here's why I'm subtracting two. I get 108 out of this, but I had to invest two, so my net gain is only 106. Right? That's why we had to subtract these two. Because putting that fatty acid, that raw fatty acid, that 16O, onto CoA required me to spend two ATP equivalents. Remember, I had to cut off the two ladder phosphates in that process. So a net gain of 106. Okay. So what if your fatty acid has some double bonds in it, right? That was just a simple 16O fatty acid. What if it has some double bonds in it? Do we have a problem? We're gonna have a problem. We have some additional steps we're gonna to have to do, right? So when we have our fatty acid, fatty acids are generally, if you have a double bond in it, in what isomeric form? The carbon-carbon double bonds are generally in what isomeric form? Yeah. yeah, they're generally cis, right? But if you look back, I'll go back a couple slides. If you look back at step two 
of our reaction here. We do the first oxidation and then we do that hydration. I ignored it at the time, but it seems like it has to be in the trans form. And it does. So if our enzyme or our fatty acid already has a double bond, it doesn't just put me at this step automatically. It's usually a cis form. I need to convert it to a trans form. So what kind of enzyme would I need to convert the cis fatty acid into the trans version of it? Isomerase. Exactly. We're going to need an isomerase. So if I have a, a, a site of unsaturation, an unsaturated fatty acid, and a position is at an odd position, right? We'll see why odd in a second. I'm just going to need an isomerase. And that's what's shown on the right here. And why an odd position? So let's look at our, our fatty acid up here. Here's our, I think this one's 16 once again. Yep, 16 carbons again. And if you take off two carbons at a time here, I notice our original double bond was at position 9, right? Because this is number 1 at the carbonyl carbon. These 7 CH2s represent positions 2 through 8. And then this first bond of the first carbon of the double bond is position 9. So this is a 16 colon 1 delta 9 fatty acid, or this name here, which you don't have to memorize. But it's got a double bond at an odd position. If I take away two, the first two carbons, right? By doing my four steps, my Ohio state again, then this thing will be a 14, one delta seven fatty acid. Everybody got promoted by two, remember? So I have 14 carbons instead of 16 after the first round. I got everything I would normally get out of it, except everybody's moved up two carbons. So the double bond is now on carbon seven in my product. It's still odd. I do it again. It moves up to carbon five, still odd. I do it a third time, it moves up to carbon three, right? And that's where I have here. Well, this could be an issue because in my very first step, I need to introduce a double bond between the alpha and beta carbons. Well, I can't because there's another double bond here. I can't put a double bond next to it. The enzyme can't do that. So instead, I just move this double bond from being between numbers three and four to being between numbers two and three. It does so, it moves it from being cis to also being trans. Okay, so this enzyme, this cis enoyl coa isomerase, does this. It moves it from being cis between 3 and 4, or on the beta position, to being trans between 2 and 3, or on the alpha position, which is exactly what we wanted before here. It's on the 2 position, on the alpha position. Okay? It still involves the beta carbon, yes. Right? And once I have it trans here, I know I can continue with my normal reactions. And I finish the rest of it. I do the, the, the hydration, the oxidation with NAD, and then the sulfur transfer onto CoA. But what did I lose in the process? So at an odd position here, all I did was isomerize it, move it to a new position. I didn't get my normal FADH2 I would get here. Remember, in a normal straight chain fatty acid, I would use an FAD to do this oxidation step. The double bond's already here, so I don't get anything out of it by having to oxidize it. I, I don't have to oxidize it. And the isomerase is free. It doesn't cost me anything. I don't get anything out of it either. So if I have an unsaturated fatty acid at an odd position, and you want to go back and do your math of how many things you get, whenever you encounter that double bond at an odd position, that round, you don't get an FADH2. So for every double bond at an odd position in your fatty acid, you need to take away an FADH2 from your tally. Right? So that's one and a half ATPs fewer if you have an uh, unsaturated at an odd position. Okay, so go through that again if it doesn't make sense. Just because we have a double bond there doesn't mean that you get everything you would normally get. I'm missing out on one of my oxidation steps. Okay, and the isomerase doesn't hurt anything or help anything. It just moves it to the right position. Okay? But what if that double bond was at an even position? Do okay, you think that might be better? Because then when it comes in, it'll be at number two already. I don't, I don't need this isomerase. That's not exactly how it works. So we have another problem. So in that case, we're still going to need an isomerase, but we're also going to need a reductase, which seems odd to do in a catabolic pathway. Right? So this part might seem a little amphibolic, right? So we're going to need to do something odd for an even position. So let's do this one more time. 
Here's another fatty acid up here at the top. This one, I think, also has 16 carbons. We have a position here for double bond, right? It happens to be on number, this is one, two, three. These four are five, six, seven, and eight. This is nine, this is 10. Let me make sure I counted it right. One, two, three, or sorry, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, right? So this double bond is at position nine, the blue one, and the next one's at position 12, the red one. Okay, so the first one, the blue double bond, is at an odd position. We know how to handle that. We start removing acetyl-CoA's one at a time, taking two carbons away at a time until this thing's down at number three, just like we wanted. The double bonds are number three. We use our isomerase from the previous slide, move the double bond from being cis to trans onto number two, shown in the next picture, and then we continue removing that as we would hydration, oxidation with NAD thiolysis. And we got everything we would get out of that round, like we said before, except not an FADH2 that time. And then we keep going. Okay? Our next double bond, which was originally at 12, has been slowly moving down two at a time until it's at permission, position four. It's been promoted by two every time. It's going to remain in an even position. So now it's at four. And you think, okay, let's do what we normally do. The first step, put the double bond between two and three. Sounds great. We use FADH2. And we make this 2,4-dienoyl-CoA. Now I have a problem. I can't hydrate this. Why would it be difficult to hydrate with the bottom right of the screen? Why would it be difficult to do anything to this molecule right now? What can you tell me about the stability of 2,4-dienoyl-CoA? It's real stable. Why? Alpha keto. Not only is it alpha keto. Alpha keto. You're correct. It's alpha. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's alpha keto. You're correct. What else makes it even more stable? Conjugated oh, Yeah, you have a third double bond that's conjugated to the first two. So this is very stable. So it will not be a substrate for our hydrating enzyme, right? So it can't do it. It's just too stable and, and the double bonds get in the, in the way. So we have to bite the bullet here and reduce this pair of double bonds to one double bond. So we're going to use a, a molecule called NADPH. We generally use those for anabolic reactions. So this is an anabolic, sorry, a catabolic pathway with an anabolic reaction in it because we had to fix this problem. Okay? So what it does is removes or adds some electrons and protons along with it and moves these double bonds around such that instead of having two double bonds on carbons two and four, we get one double bond between them on three. And that's a favorable reaction in the presence of NADPH, which is the reducing molecule. So we turn the 2,4-dienoyl-CoA into a single double bond at position three, which now it looks just like we had when we had an odd position double bond. So we can play that game. We just move it using the normal enzyme we would use for the odd position over to number two and continue from there. Right? So we don't lose anything when it's at an even position, whereas we lost an FADH2 in our product tally when it was at an odd position. However, we did have to spend an NADPH. Right? So if you look back what I wrote, if it's at an odd position, we get one fewer FADH2 for every one of those odd positioned double bonds but we don't lose anything when we have it at an even position. However, we do consume one of our NADPHs from somewhere, right? But NADPH is equivalent electronically or energetically to an NADH. It's worth two and a half ATPs. We don't lose an NADH from our tally. Don't, don't say you do that. But we do lose uh, NADPH's potential for ATP later. Okay, so you can think of it as losing an NADH, although we physically don't but energetically it's equivalent to it. So for every odd position double bond, we're gonna lose 1.5 ATPs from one fewer FADH2. And for every even position double bond, we will lose 2.5 ATPs because the, the use of an NADPH causes me a loss of 2.5 ATPs in potential. So that's how you calculate your tallies. So if I gave you this molecule, this lining oil CoA with 16 carbon and two double bonds, one at an even position, one at an odd position, you could tally up how much ATP it's worth. And I suggest you do that as an exercise. Don't forget to subtract the two in the end because you still had to put it on CoA. Okay. 
The other scenario is what if your length of your chain is odd? I don't mean a double bond at an odd position. I mean just the overall chain is not 16 or 12 or 14 or 20. It's 17 or 13 or 9. Right? It's an odd number of carbons. Well, that could be a problem because we take it apart two at a time. So what we do is if you have an odd number of carbons, in this ACO-CoA up here, you take it apart as you would normally, two at a time, until we only have three left. Right? So you, your last round involved a ACO-CoA that was five carbons long. You took away two in your normal four reactions of, of oxidation, hydration, oxidation, and sulfur transfer. And we got everything we would normally get out of that. And our final product is not an acetyl-CoA, it's a propionyl-CoA. It's got three carbons left. And we can't do anything to that. Right? We can't remove two more carbons. You just can't, it can't function with that substrate. So what do we do with this leftover three-carbon CoA? Well, it's not very useful in its current state. We need to make it four carbons. So what we do is we carboxylate it. And that's shown on the right here. We take propionyl-CoA, same molecule, and we add a CO2 to it. Right? This is another of our carboxylases. We saw these already with biot with uh, not biotin, we haven't done that one yet. With uh, pyruvate carboxylase, right? We added a CO2 to make oxaloacetate. Here we have propionyl CoA carboxylase. We're gonna add a CO2 to make it four carbons instead of three. But it doesn't put it on the end, it puts it on the second carbon, the alpha carbon. Okay, this requires a biotin cofactor. It also requires ATP. Much in the same way, we're going to do the reaction at the end of the lecture today of uh, starting fatty acid synthesis. So essentially, uh, what I want you to know is we turn propionyl CoA into a four carbon methylmalonyl CoA. It does have four carbons, but it's not straight. You notice it's branched. Well, that's a problem. We don't like branched carbons, we like to keep them straight. So I have this branching issue. This is the only place it will put it, but I have a branched carbon chain. How do I fix that? I need to move it. Right, so what I do is the next enzyme called methylmalonyl-CoA epimerase is it switches the position of the carboxyl groups. Right, the CoA, instead of being on this carbon, is now on this carbon. Now that may look like it's identical. Right? That may look exactly like you put it on one carbonyl to the other. It's the same molecule. It is, in fact, I've, I've changed it from a D. This is a tetrahedral carbon, right? It's a chiral center changed it from D to L. That's the only thing this enzyme has changed. Okay, so I changed it from a D carbon to an L carbon, right? because the next enzyme will only use the L version. And the next enzyme does another swap. It's a mutase, also an isomerase. It switches what's on the alpha carbon for what's on the beta carbon, one of its protons. So we switch this for this. right? So we switch places, and now I have all four carbons in a straight chain. Right, we've done some rearranging. But I finally get to succinyl-CoA, and you know what to do with that. That can enter the citric acid cycle at that point. Okay, so when I tear my fatty acid apart, I get a bunch of acetyl-CoAs, which can enter the citric acid cycle, a bunch of FADH2s, NADHs, which can enter the electron transport chain. But this propionyl-CoA is not part of any of that. So I use this carboxylase to make it into a four-carbon chain. I switch the geometry from D to L, and then I make it unbranched, by using this methylmalonyl-CoA mutase, and now I have a four-carbon succinyl-CoA, and you know what to do with it. It can enter the citric acid cycle. Okay, So you know what to do with straight chains, you know what to do with double bonds at odd and even positions, and now you know how to handle an odd chain fatty acid. Okay, I could go over the mechanism of this methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. It's quite interesting, and it uses a radical chemistry, but for this class, we'll skip it. So if you have the old slide set, skip the next two slides. And the last thing we can make from this uh, destruction of, of fatty acids is ketone bodies. Okay, so our acetyl-CoA, that we just made a lot of it, could enter into the citric acid cycle. But in order to do so, it needs a corresponding co-substrate, right? It needs an oxaloacetate to continue. Well, what if you don't have a lot of oxaloacetate? When would you not have a lot of oxaloacetate? Well, how do we make oxaloacetate? Just follow the logic. Oxaloacetate is made from two things. You can make it from some amino acids, which we'll cover on Thursday, or you can make it from pyruvate. So pyruvate can be converted to oxaloacetate. You already know how to do this. It's the first step of gluconeogenesis. And then we could continue with converting 
are oxaloacetate plus an acetyl-CoA and a citrate and doing the citric acid cycle. But if you don't have any glucose, then you don't have any pyruvate, then you can't make oxaloacetate, at least not from acetyl-CoA. Okay, so no way you could turn acetyl-CoA into a net gain of oxaloacetate. So we have a problem. If we degrade a lot of fats, right, then we can't make oxaloacetate from it. We need some sugar source. So we take all this excess acetyl-CoA and turn it into ketone bodies. Okay? The other thing we can do with it is if you have uh, an untreated diabetic, right, it might sound like there's a lot of sugar around, and there is in the blood, but not in the cell. So an untreated diabetic has lots of sugar in their blood, but it looks like they're starving for sugar inside the cell, right? And an alcoholic looks the same way. There's an imbalance. So for a, a diabetic or untreated diabetic, inside the cell you have a low amount of sugar, which means a low amount of pyruvate and a low amount of oxaloacetate. But you have a lot of acetyl-CoA. Why? Because the cell is starving for fuel. So it starts degrading its fatty acids. It's long since degraded all its glycogen. Okay? So there's an imbalance. There's too much acetyl-CoA to the amount of oxaloacetate we have. In an alcoholic, you have the same problem. Although there's lots of sugar around, you have lots of ethanol you're consuming. The ethanol is converted to acetate, or ethanaldehyde, and then acetate, acetaldehyde acetate. And finally, we put it on CoA to make acetyl-CoA. So inside the cell, there's lots of acetyl-CoA compared to oxaloacetate again. So an untreated diabetic and an alcoholic look the same inside the cell. Too much acetyl-CoA for not enough oxaloacetate. So they will start making ketone bodies in both cases. So the ketone bodies we're going to make are 3-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. And here's how we make them. And this is going to be a pathway we're going to see again on Thursday when we get to making cholesterol. So we're going to start with acetyl-CoA's on the left. At the bottom, you have a red one and a blue one. So the two acetyl-CoA's come together. One attacks the other's carbonyl, right? You probably can guess which one's happening here, right? So the blue CoA is leaving. So we have the red methyl group. It's going to get deprotonated, and the carbon's going to attack the blue carbonyl, right? It goes up and forms an O minus, collapses back to a carbonyl, and the blue CoA is set packing, right? So now I've connected these two, two carbon chains into one four carbon chain. It's called acetoacetyl-CoA, because it's two acetate groups back to back. And my acetoacetyl-CoA is not stable. Anybody tell me why? Beta keto. Once again, beta keto. This theme doesn't seem to be going away. All right, so my beta keto group, and then once again, I have a third acetyl-CoA come in, in green here, right? And we have an attack happening again, right? So who's attacking whom in this case? So look at the products, the green CoA is leaving, and I'm making a six carbon chain, except it's a branched. So who's attacking whom in the second step? So let me remind you in the first step, the red methyl group was deprotonated and it attacked the blue carbonyl. Here we have a green acetyl-CoA coming in. Who attacks whom? Is the green deprotonated and attacks the blue? It's the exact same thing, right. The green methyl group gets deprotonated and attacks the blue carbonyl again. We pick on the same carbonyl all the time. So it's the same equivalent chemistry. So the green one attacks, except at this point, when the blue carbonyl forms an O minus, right, we leave it as a hydroxy group, right? That's where the water comes in, right? The water cleaves off the CoA, and we end up with an OH here. Okay, we've seen this reaction before, okay? At this point, it's no longer unstable because we've split the, the double bonds away from each other, right? They're not beta keto anymore. This is called hydroxymethylglutaryl CoA, right, or HMG-CoA is the abbreviation for this. The H and the M stands for hydroxy and a methyl, and those are both the substituents on carbon number three, or the beta carbon. All right, so three hydroxy, three methyl. Gluteryl, glute, once again, stands for five carbons in a row with a carboxyl at each end, much like glutamate, right, or glutamine, or alpha-ketoglutarate. 
So we have five carbons in a row, right, with a hydroxy and a methyl on number three. And this is going to be our starting point, or our, one of our molecules we're going to use to make cholesterol on Thursday. So, but for now, this is fairly stable, and then we let the acetyl-CoA go that we started with, the red one, is free to leave, and when it leaves, we collapse this back to a carbonyl to make acetoacetate, and there's no more CoAs attached. So we've used the energy in those ester bonds. It took three acetyl-CoAs to do it, and the CoAs all leaving, right, to attach two, two carbon groups into an acetyl acetate. Okay. Is acetoacetate stable once again? So the product of step three here, acetoacetate, is that stable? No. No. What? No. Beta keto. Beta keto. This is the same game, beta keto. Right? So the most likely way to resolve this situation, if you left it alone, would be to simply lose the bottom CO2, right? We just lose it, decarboxylate it. Right, this C should be green, I guess. But you decarboxylate the CO2. Right, so we lose it, and that leaves me with a three-carbon molecule that's a ketone, that's just acetone. And that's not a very good idea. Right, so acetone, as you know, is an organic solvent. It'll disrupt the membranes, and our cells will die. So we don't want that to happen. So we have an enzyme that will convert our acetoacetate into 3-hydroxybutyrate. This looks like an enzyme you've seen already, right? If I convert acetoacetate into 3-hydroxybutyrate, this looks very similar to what other enzyme you've seen. I'm trying to connect things for you. It also uses NADH. If you can imagine the blue methyl group, instead of being a methyl, being another carboxyl group, what would this enzyme be? You've seen it three times now. Right? If this blue methyl were a carboxyl group, it would be four carbons long with a carboxyl on each end and a carbonyl on two. That would be oxaloacetate. And our product over here, if this methyl group were a carboxyl group still, it would be four carbons long, carboxyl on each end, and a hydroxy on two. That would be malate. So this would be malate dehydrogenase run backwards, much like you've seen when we were doing the malate shuttle. But it's not a carboxyl group, it's a methyl group, so it's a slightly different enzyme. Right? And it converts acetoacetate, instead of oxaloacetate, into 3-hydroxybutyrate instead of malate. And 3-hydroxybutyrate, but indicating four carbons again, 3-hydroxybutyrate right? is one of our two, acetoacetate being the other, ketone bodies. And ketone bodies are used by certain tissues like the brain and red blood cells and the uh, renal cortex as fuel in preference to glucose. They'd rather have this than glucose. Right? But we do this oxidation, or sorry, this reduction, oxidation of NADH, reduction of the molecule to the butyrate in order to pre prevent it from forming the acetone. Why would we do all this in the first place? We have no sugar. Right? We need to supply ourselves with fuel, and we have no sugar to make oxaloacetate. So we make this instead. Right? This is not oxaloacetate. It cannot be turned into it. But we use this as fuel instead of glucose. So here's an example of how we'd use that. So um, heart cells, renal cortex, as I mentioned, on the kidney, um, red blood cells tend to use this as fuel in preference to glucose. Right? So let's look at our days of starvation at the bottom. And the first two days of starvation, assuming you have a water source, because you're going to die quickly without water. But assuming you have water but no food. In the first couple days of starvation, you're okay. You might feel a little tired, but the blood glucose level doesn't drop tremendously. And the reason for that is because your reserves of glycogen are going to be utilized, mainly from the liver. When the liver finally runs out of glycogen, we need to start getting glucose from somewhere else. So we degrade what? Where can I get glucose if it's not from the liver? Well, you think, maybe muscles. No, muscles are very selfish. They're not letting their glucose go. Okay, we'll just degrade the muscle cell completely. So the largest muscles 
you know, the, the ones on your back and your legs and your arms, aren't as useful at that moment as are the ones that are pumping blood, like, like the heart and the, the muscles of the diaphragm. Those are way more important than those big muscles on your arms, legs, and back, right? Because they're expendable at this point. So we're gonna lose a few muscle cells, right? This is wasting of, of muscle. We're also gonna get some amino acids from those muscles, which can be turned into glucose, some of them. All right, we'll talk about that next time as well. But also you notice the spike in ketone bodies. So the excess acetyl-CoA from all these membrane lipids that we're degrading as well is gonna turn into ketone bodies. You see also a spike in the fatty acids available, right? If you go on to day uh, 40 of this, right, past day eight of this chart, we go all the way to day 40, look at the table on the right, the number of grams of food being used, glucose goes from 40 grams down, down I mean, from 100 grams down to 40 grams, and ketone bodies is doubled from the third day to the 40th day to 100 grams of use in 24 hours. So you're sustaining yourself on ketone bodies way more than glucose at this point. The glucose that's still around is coming from amino acids that you're degrading. Okay, so starvation can go on for a long time as long as you have fuel reserves. First thing that's going to go is available glucose. Next thing, the glucose in the form of glycogen from the liver. The next thing we're going to start degrading muscle cells from the bigger muscles, which are not as useful at the moment. So we're going to get amino acids, we're going to get lipids, we're going to get glycogen from the muscle cells, glycogen stores, because we're just ripping the cell apart. Right? But it can only go on so long. After you go on to you know, 100 day of starvation, you probably have no more reserves, depending on your body mass. But you have to have water the whole time. Okay. All right, let's switch gears real quick. And instead of talking about degrading it, we're going to make fatty acids. So this will go much faster. Uh, it's a really simple process. Uh, we have to activate our fatty acid, our, our, uh, our starting material, which is acetyl-CoA. We're going to do it in a very similar way that you've seen before. And then we put the, the two carbons back together onto a growing chain. We've seen this before. And we're going to add it two carbons at a time. So we're, we're going to make it an even fatty acid into a longer even fatty acid, an odd one into a longer odd one. And then we're done. We need to pull away some of these oxygens because acetyl-CoA has a lot of oxygen in it compared to a long chain fatty acid. So we need to reverse the steps that we did to degrade it. So remember it was Ohio State before. Unfortunately, the acronym is not Michigan this time, but it's going to be the opposite processes from that oxidation, hydration, oxidation step. Okay. So when would you want to store things as fatty acids? Well, number one, if you're hibernate, preparing to hibernate for the winter, like these bears are doing, right? They want to eat a lot of food. They don't need it for food for, for energy right now. They could store it as glycogen, but glycogen is a great storage if you need fuel quickly. They're going to be hibernating. The only thing they need to do is just maintain homeostasis. So they can store it as a better food source, and that's fats. If you calculated it like we did before, Fatty acids have much more ATP storage, 106 for that 16 carbons, rather than glucose does and glycogen. All right, so let's start building it from our, our starting point, which is just uh, acetyl-CoA. And if you have too much acetyl-CoA, we're going to store it as fatty acids. This is also true in alcoholics, right? Remember, we have the excess of ethanol, which turns into acetyl-CoA. We're going to store it as fats, since we have no oxaloacetate to go with it, we'll just store it as fat. So that's going to happen in the liver. So in the, an amateur alcoholic might have some fatty liver, right, where you have some fat deposits being formed in adipose tissue. It's totally reversible if you, you know, turn down the alcoholic abuse. But if you keep going, it turns into those cells become so engrossed in fatty acids that they die and you get fibrosis. So those cells will become fibrotic, get scar tissue. That's still recoverable if you stop at this point. But if you continue, then the scar tissue becomes connective tissue. So connective tissue grows in. This is not a recoverable state. It's holding your liver together at this point. And that damage is irreversible. We call that cirrhosis. So these are career alcoholics at this point. And the only solution now is to get a liver transplant. But if you're a career alcoholic, you're not likely to be high on the transplant list. Okay, let's start at the beginning with acetyl-CoA. Okay. So acetyl-CoA is mainly found in what area of the cell? Where is the bulk of our acetyl-CoA going to be found? Do 
Your choices are in the mitochondrial matrix or in the cytoplasm. Mitochondria. Yeah, in the matrix, exactly, because that's where we have a lot of our acetyl-CoA made. Right, so you have excess acetyl-CoA. We need to remove it from the mitochondrial matrix out into the cytoplasm. Now, for the alcoholic, it's already in the cytoplasm. How convenient. Right? But for the normal process of making more membranes and making more fatty acids, we have to move our acetyl-CoA out of the matrix. Well, to do that, we employ a mechanism that we've already seen. We can take oxaloacetate, combine it with acetyl-CoA to make citrate. This is step one of the citric acid cycle. Right? As shown in the diagram here, we take our oxaloacetate plus acetyl-CoA and make citrate. Step one, citric acid cycle. But instead of doing step two and turning it into isocitrate, since we don't want to do that right now, we have lots of ATP, I want to store this for later. I'm going to export the citrate. And I had one of those antiporters, remember that Rube Goldberg machine that we talked about? We can export a citrate if you import a pyruvate. So it's an antiporter that lets one out if lets the other one in. Okay, we can do that. I let the citrate out. I convert citrate back into oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA, right? This is doing step one of the citric acid cycle in reverse, but we're not in the matrix. We're doing it out here in the cytoplasm. So this is an enzyme that does that specifically. We turn oxaloacetate back into malate, right? That sounds like something we've done before, right? So we reduce it down to malate. And then we take malate and convert it to pyruvate. What's the difference there? Well, I go from four carbons to three carbons. I have to lose a CO2, and I also have to oxidize it once. So I get an NADPH out of it. So essentially, I've exchanged an NADH for an NADPH. That's not a big deal. And I sent the pyruvate back in. Not shown here in this diagram is turning pyruvate into oxaloacetate will also require an input of CO2 and ATP by pyruvate carboxylase. That was our first step of gluconeogenesis. So that's not shown in the diagram here, but that's going to be an input of ATP here and CO2. But effectively, we've moved the acetyl-CoA out of the mitochondria without having to drag the CoA across the membrane. Our separate pools of CoA remain separate. So kind of the same scenario. Should sound familiar. Okay. All right, then lastly, we take our acetyl-CoA out here, right, and we have to activate it. Okay, this, is, this is not exactly the same as we had before. It's already on a CoA. What do you mean by activate it again? I mean, it's not a very unstable molecule at the moment. It's just an acetyl-CoA. Yeah, it's got a thioester bond, but that's not near enough to make a carbon-carbon new bond. So what we're going to do is take the acetyl-CoA right, and add yet another carbon to it. We're going to carboxylate the acetyl-CoA. So we're going to turn it from being two carbons into three carbons. We turn acetyl-CoA into malonyl-CoA. Right. This is a, a two-step process. It's an enzyme called acetyl-CoA carboxylase. The first step tells, lets me put the, the carboxyl group on an ATP. We're going to activate the CO2 as well. It's in the form of bicarbonate right now in red here. And we're going to activate the bicarbonate by putting it on an AMP. We've seen this before. We've done it with fatty acids. We've done it with amino acids. We've done it with glucoses. You put it on a, a, a mono phosphate version of the triphosphate starting point. So ATP loses two phosphates and becomes AMP attached to bicarb. Then, of course, another molecule comes along. In this case, the methyl group gets deprotonated and attacks the bicarbonate that's on the AMP. And then it leaves. It's not exactly how it happens, but it's close enough for what you need to know. Um, and then it leaves as AMP, and we have a new carbon-carbon bond. I won't go into the details of that because I spent you know, five years of my life researching that for my dissertation. But now we've taken a CO2 and put it on a two carbon chain to make a three carbon chain. Acetyl-CoA to malonyl-CoA, how much did it cost me? It cost me one ATP equivalent. Is malonyl-CoA stable? Beta keto. Right, it's beta keto. Once again, we're taking advantage of a beta keto arrangement. So I've made an unstable molecule that I can then use that instability or unstable energy in to power the next step. Okay? 
So what's not shown between here and the next slide is, is, is very subtle. I guess I need to make a slide for it. Is I'm going to take this acetyl-CoA, turn it into a malonyl-CoA as shown here. I'm going to take yet another acetyl-CoA and leave it as acetyl-CoA. So I have a malonyl-CoA and a second acetyl-CoA. Keep that in mind. Okay? I'm not just using one. I have two, one of which I carboxylate. Okay. So I take one acetyl-CoA, leave it alone, drag it along to the next slide, and have another acetyl-CoA, which I carboxylate, it's a malonyl-CoA. And then I take both of those molecules, the acetyl-CoA and the malonyl-CoA, and transfer them off of their carrier, which is currently CoA, onto something called an acyl carrier protein. Okay. It's just another protein, right? and it's substituting for CoA. Here's a picture of it at the bottom. It's a tiny protein and it's got a, a cofactor attached to it, right? And it's long coenzyme here, has a sulfur on the end. Okay, that's all you gotta know. It's a pantothenic acid group, just like the one holding it on CoA. But instead of being a AMP back here, it's a protein. Okay, so it looks almost exactly like CoA. So do you think transferring the acetyl group or the malonyl group from CoA to this is rather free? Right? It's an easy transfer. It doesn't cost a thing. Right, so I'm transferring the, the acetyl group, the two carbon group, off of CoA onto my ACP, acyl carrier protein, and my malonyl CoA, I'm transferring the malonyl group off of the CoA onto a second acyl carrier protein. That's the only thing that changed between the last slide and this one. Okay? And they're going to stay on this the rest of the way. Right, so my two carbon acetyl group went from CoA to the ACP. Here it is at the top. I just replaced CoA with ACP here. They're both on the same sulfur or same sulfur arrangement. And I have my malonyl group attached to its ACP now. Okay, here's where these two come together. We said the malonyl group was not stable. Fine. Let the CO2 leave. And that's what we allow, allow to happen. So the CO2 I just put on is allowed to leave. Well, that leaves behind a CH2 with a negative charge. That sounds like a great nucleophile. And it is. So we decarboxylate the very same CO2 I put on. So I spent the energy to put it on just to let it leave so that I facilitate this next attack. So the CH2 with a negative charge attacks the blue carbonyl, sounds like a theme, right? And this goes up and forms O minus, eventually collapses back to the carbonyl and the blue ACP leaves, All right? So now I've created a one, two, this carbon leaves, three, four carbon chain. Right? That's called acetoacetyl ACP. This looks very similar to what we did with ketone bodies, except this time it's attached to my carrier protein, not just floating around or attached to CoA. That's the difference. The cell knows what it's doing here. So here I do a similar reaction. I take this third carbon carbonyl and reduce it to an alcohol. This looks a lot like my HMG CoA, except it's not. Right? I'm not, I don't have five carbons this time. I only have four. And I still make a 3-hydroxy or a beta-hydroxy butyryl ACP. Again, on ACP tells the cell what we're doing. We're not doing ketone body synthesis. We're not doing degradation. We're doing amino acid, or sorry, not amino acid, but fatty acid synthesis. Right? The other major thing is, where am I doing all this? I'm doing all this in the cytoplasm. Where did I do all my fatty acid degradation? In the matrix of the mitochondria of compartmentalizing these things, keeping them separate. Degrade in the matrix, assemble in the cytoplasm. Don't try to do both things in the same chamber. Bacteria do do that, right? So they have a way around that, but it's much simpler. But we keep it in separate chambers. Degrade the fatty acids in the matrix, make the fatty acids in the cytoplasm. Easy way to keep the two pools separate. We've been talking about how we keep all the CoA pools separate as well. Okay? So we have this 3-hydroxybutyryl ACP. We lose a water molecule, the OH on the beta carbon, and a proton on the alpha carbon. We make a crotonyl ACP, which is a double bond in there. And then we reduce the double bond to a single bond to make butyryl ACP. Let's contrast these reactions to what we had before. Remember before we had Ohio State. Let's read that backwards, right? So we had oxidation, hydration, oxidation, sulfur transfer. Let's read it backwards. So sulfur transfer would be, opposite of that would be transfer off of sulfur instead of onto one. Remember, we put it on a CoA there. Let's take it off of a CoA, or in this case, off of an ACP. 
That's exactly what we did. We lost this blue ACP, so we took it off of a sulfur. The next would be opposite of oxidation. Well, that's reduction. That's what we're doing. We're reducing this carbonyl to uh, alcohol. Then the opposite of hydration would be dehydration. So we remove a water. And then finally, the opposite of the first step, which was oxidation, is another reduction. So this is Ohio State in reverse. We condense it instead of removing it from, or instead of putting a sulfur on it, we remove it from a sulfur and make a new carbon-carbon bond. It's called condensation. We do reduction, dehydration, reduction, instead of oxidation, hydration, oxidation. So it's the opposite series of pathways. And it's exactly the, the same molecules. The beta carbon is the one we're doing this to. If you were to follow this in reverse, it looks like degradation. So we're doing the exact same chemistry, except this time, both of the reduction reactions require NADPH because it's a purely anabolic pathway. Anabolic steps tend to use NADPH, not NADH. Again, that's how eukaryotic cells tell the difference of what we're doing. Okay, and lastly, I'll leave you with a little comment about the liver. This isn't new. People have known a lot of this for a long time, right? The chemical steps and the knowing of the atoms and how the, the energetics work, that's relatively recent for science. But people have known, the cultures have known about the importance of the liver for a very long time, right? We know it makes, it's our source of fatty acids. All cells do it, but the liver has a, the vast majority of the, the role in making fatty acids. It has the, the vast majority of the role in storing our glycogen from the last lecture. So without the liver, you can't survive between meals. Right? So it's kind of an important organ. And ancient cultures like the Greeks and the Egyptians here knew this and they made sculptures and incorporated it into their mythology. Uh, one, of the mytholo one of the myths around this was the, the myth of Prometheus. Right? You may have, I don't mean the movie uh, with aliens, I mean the, the, the god Prometheus in Greek mythology. Um, and similar god in, in Roman mythology later, and of course the ancient Egyptians adopted the Greek mythology as well. So Prometheus was guilty of something in the, the myth. He was guilty of providing humans knowledge, right? Giving humans the knowledge of fire, right? Something we shouldn't have had. We didn't, shouldn't have that. So Zeus, the, the leader of the gods in the mythology, punished him. He chained him to a rock and had an eagle show up every day to eat most of his liver. Like, he was a god, so he survived, of course. But they knew that if a person were to have most of their liver removed while they're living, you could lose part of your liver from, you know, a stabbing, or you get mauled by a boar, or whatever it might be. If you, most, you lose most of an organ, it generally doesn't grow back. But the liver will, right? You can lose 90% of your liver. And as long as you don't lose the part around the hepatic portal vein, where the blood supply is, it will grow back. One of the very few organs that will. Right, in humans. If you lose your arm, it doesn't grow back. Right? But if you lose most of your liver, it will grow back. So they incorporated that knowledge into their mythos as well. An eagle would come along and eat his liver, most of it, and then fly away. And the next day he would come and eat it again because it had grown back. Now, of course, they sped up the recovery because he was a god. But they knew that the liver would grow back, and that's seen in their mythology. 